So Troy, I, I, what I need to get across here in the uh, the, the pre-intro thing is to my audio listeners, right? Because the audio listeners, they're thinking, you know, they're, they're getting this off of iTunes and they're wondering, well, where are all these episodes that we that we've skipped? Well, you've got to look at the video episodes. I'm sorry for right now. You've got to look at the video episodes to get all of the content, which is weird because the audio episodes supposedly have more audio content time-wise. But uh, I am I'm a busy man. I can't be. Uh, bothered to to get all of this stuff done and so if you want to uh to see all of this you need to go to uh the flashback comics and games youtube youtube I, channel as well as comicsonline.blip.tv to get all of the the recent episodes eventually will i catch up probably well you know kevin one more thing too. what's that uh we used to provide a link to the Facebook page, or on the Facebook page for the YouTube uh, videos, so maybe oh, yeah. we could yeah, go yeah. back to doing that. And we will do that. We will do that as well. We, we will do that. We, we kind of lost a, uh, an employee, and that sort of didn't uh, exactly, or we, they. Uh, no. we, <laughs> flash, didn't, flashback. we didn't lose her. She went on to bigger and better things. Wait, well, that's that's a way to lose somebody. No, it's no, not no, like no, she, no. She, losing, she got lost in the mail. Losing is she like... She got lost on the way here. She got, she got grabbed she, by she, someone else. She fell out of a hole that was in my pocket right right <laughs> she's she's in the back of the lot where all those 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 lost socks are i have all of my socks do you i do are you sure i have it's 40 because- 44 pairs of socks and they are all freshly laundered and they are all made it up that's weird that you would know that sorry about this long intro Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> Hello again, and welcome to the Comics Online Podcast, Season 15, Episode 18. I'm your host, Kevin Goswana. With me today, as usual, is our co-host, Troy David Phillips, store manager here at Flashback Comics and Games in Woodbridge, Virginia. Yes, indeed. I am still the manager at Flashback Comics and Games. <clears throat> Craig and Larry apparently have not come to their senses. Whack it. <laughs> today, was, it was snowing here in Virginia today. And that so was not a snow. It was a little, well, it was snowing enough to where I... I was working from home, in theory, and uh, and so I'm I'm not wearing a tie and stuff like that today. I've just got I, I'm I've not got, wearing a tie. I'm, I'm I've got the Ob Noodle House. Shout out to uh, to the folks at Ob Noodle House in Ocean Beach, California. And today I'm rocking my long sleeved uh, thermal tee of Superman. Shout out to the family of Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, uh, DC Comics, a subsidiary of Time Warner. So today and the Doomed Planet Krypton. Naturally, <laughs> today we've got uh, we've got our top five. This is our uh, yep. as always the flashback top five. We're gonna do, run through our top fives, and then we've got something special for you: games. Yeah, we got I got a special guest. I I, I sprung this on you in the last minute. This is gonna be pretty incredible, though. We can talk some games. <clears throat> It'll be fun. He's a stellar gentleman. All right, all right. So uh, top fives. Let's 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 hear your top five. What do okay. you got for this week? I'll I'll wait. You 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 talk, and I will start throwing this stuff up. Okay. Okay. Before you show that one, my number one pick this week for my top five is homage to Flash Comics 123. It featured the meeting of Barry Allen and Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick, the Flash of the Golden Age. Barry Allen, the Flash of the Modern Age. Modern at that time. Modern at that time. Cemented the concept of the multiverse, Earth 1 and Earth 2. Somehow, the original Flash came from Earth 2, while the new Flash came from Earth 1. I don't know how that worked. It's DC, it's DC logic. National periodicals at the time. Ah. Anyhow. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. We've been doing these variant covers, or DC has. I shouldn't say we like I'm on their team. But uh, but you're I do like DC team Comics. As much as you can be. <laughs> you're on their team like you're on a sports team. Oh. You know what I mean? Like you, you wear that, that Washington footballers club thing. Yeah, what am I, the twelfth man? You're the you're the, the <laughs> Washington fo- I, I won't call them their their nasty name, but the Washington footballers, you know them. Ah uh, ha 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 ha. In any event, check this out. So uh Vendetti at the writing helm. Uh, Flash is Flash has been really good. Sorry, I thought we had a technical problem, but we actually do not. All right. uh, and uh, look, isn't that stuff just beautiful? Find me a good page and throw it up there, Kev. I'm about to. Uh, keep going. Keep going. A- have you been following the Flash from DC Comics of late? Have you Have you, you know seen what, what they've been doing with? Let's, uh, let's just go with this. This is a little little 
uh, interesting uh, panel Mike work here. Kevin. Say what? Mike on Kevin when he's oh, talking. This, oh, this is a little bit of uh, interesting panel work. That's all I was saying. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm loving that cover. Uh, having uh, the two flashes and then the third flash just running right in there. Um, it's it's a great comic, you know. They've uh, they've given us the Black Flash. They've given us uh, new rogues. They've reintroduced Wally West. Uh, they've given us a reimagined Iris West. Barry's in a relationship with a woman from uh, Central City PD named Patty Spivet. Uh, there's it's 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 been really incredible. Um, what can I say? What can I say? You're, you're... There's a joke in there somewhere. Look, there's a blue flash. Uh... There's a blue flash! Oh my goodness! Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, Kevin, you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to jump into the flash here. You're gonna have to have a lot more hope than the blue flash for me to start back into the flash again. Except for the television show, which I love. Well, the television show is awesome, but you know what? I give you recommendations. You take my recommendations, and you generally find that you like them. So, uh, I think you should keep you accepting. You are usually right. <clears throat> yes, I am. Uh, was that painful for you to say? Yeah. Well, well no. I mean, people know you by now. They're, they 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 know that you're you you have really good advice when it comes to comic books. So you can come on in here to Flashback Comics and Games. Anyhow, your next pick, Sundowners. Tim Seeley is on Sundowners from Dark Horse Comics. Comic is incredible. Started out introducing us to uh, a psychiatrist who, for what reasons we didn't know, couldn't practice, and his encounter group. Uh, an encounter group kind of like an Alcoholics Anonymous. These people suffer Sundowner Syndrome. Sun goes down, they put on their costumes, and they fight crime in the streets. Only, they're not all wrapped too tightly. These people do have issues. Despite the fact that they have issues, they weren't hallucinating, they weren't making stuff up, there really was something going on, and now the good doctor is on board with them. Uh, Sundowners is an interesting take on uh, psychology and uh, characterization, as we've come to expect from Tim Seeley. Tim Seeley, you may recognize the name from uh, Batman Eternal, from Grayson, from the Image Comic Revival. Uh, yeah, it's it's great stuff. You need to support Dark Horse, support Tim Seeley, support Sundowners. It's amazing. They they obviously have issues. They're up to number six. <laughs> oh. I didn't want to interrupt your monologuing. So oh. your next one, Troy. My next one is also from Dark Horse Comics. Now, Mike Richardson at the writing helm on this one. This is the fourth and final issue of Father's Day. In Father's Day, we are given a father, and he meets his daughter, uh, his out-of-wedlock daughter, who wondered where her dad disappeared to, so she tracked him down. In the process of doing so, she made it possible for dad to be discovered by people from his past. Villainous, murderous people from his past. As it turns out, though, his daughter was not a helpless heroin, you know, a, a, a helpless uh, damsel in distress type. Uh, she could actually wield a frying pan and a kitchen knife with some lethal accuracy. Uh, she was able to connect with her father and get involved in the things that were going on in his life. And so they both fight for their survival together, getting out of this dastardly situation. Father's Day from Dark Horse has been wonderful. Four issues and it's over, but come in here to Flashback Comics and I'll see if I can hook you up. I like the use of the tie, and I've got this in the uh, in the logo. That's, yes, that's clever. Yes. That's clever. Uh, you know what, Kevin? I actually like getting ties on Father's Day. Me too. Bow ties, please. <laughs> I've got I've got like forty regular ties. I he don't is really like he though. is like the reincarnation of Jimmy Olsen. People, I am not kidding. What, I, do, what? I do have quite a few, and and a bunch of them are. are if, you see, if you see the small ones, the the narrow ones that I wear, those are uh, hand me downs from my grandfather, uh, who was like myself a, a, a government contractor uh, back in his day, and he uh, he would. Uh, always wear bow ties. He had to wear, you know, back in those days, you had to wear bow ties to work, or you had to wear ties to work, and he yeah. would always wear bow ties, and they're all clip-ons. Like, every one, every <laughs> one of those narrow ones that you see me wear, they're all clip-ons. Um, but they're wonderful, and they're from, like, the 60s, so there you go. Uh, I'm also from the 60s, Kevin. I am not. <laughs> so, Justice Inc., number six. Justice Inc., number six, from Dynamite Entertainment. Justice Inc. brings together classic characters, The Shadow, The Avenger, and Doc Savage. Um, it, the, all characters with uh, pulp novel history behind them. All characters from a much grimmer and grittier uh, time period. Uh, 
Doc Savage is the least likely to kill somebody among these characters. Uh, the, Sh- the Avenger is somewhere in between the two. And you know the Shadow. You know, it's all guns, and guts, and two blazing 45s. You know the Shadow. Look at the Shadow right here taking people out. Oh, my goodness. I've been loving Dynamite Entertainment has been using these characters, these classic characters, not just these three, but they also had given us... Uh, the uh oh lord it, it is named just the black terror uh right. black terror and miss fury uh and just so many classic comic and novel characters uh justice inc again you know bringing in three more of them putting them all together giving them a great story so i i, I wave the dynamite banner yet one more time now kevin here's getting distracted on my fifth and final pick for the night uh <clears throat> For, for, for this week, anyway. Oh, all right. Jason Aaron at the writing helm here, giving us the latest issue of Thor. Thor, number four. Thor, number four. Uh, it's wonderful. We're still dealing with the uh, female who is holding the hammer of Thor, wielding the power, fighting frost giants, finding herself locked in a room that she can't escape from, you know, separated from the hammer. Oh, my God, what to do next? Who is she? We still don't know. Old Thor and new f- Thor fighting together They're, on the floor. Exactly. Is, Sto- somehow this has to be a, a some sort of a... Uh, well, storylines that are picked up from Jason Aaron's other, the previous book, Dr. Thor, Seuss. God of Thunder. Um, <clears throat> listen to you. So, uh, in the in the uh, pages of Thor, God of Thunder, of course, you remember, we met uh, not only our contemporary Thor, but also far future Thor and distant past Thor. Young, Those were arrogant, awesome. hot-headed. Yes, they were. Uh, so, Jason Aaron, it continues to do the things that he does very well with Thor, God of Thunder. I am a big fan of the writing of Jason Aaron. Uh, I was a fan of his, uh, his epic from uh, last year, uh, Original Sin. And I would also shout up some of the other works of Jason Aaron, like Men of Wrath and Southern Bastards. Um, yeah, you know, and Star Wars and the latest Star Wars, which is amazement. Talking about Thor, you want to pick this up. This is the fourth issue. It sells fast and strong. Do not delay. Do not hesitate. That that spoiler there with with Thor sort of swearing uh, was just on the second page, so don't worry. <laughs> um, and he 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 goes up. Let me just show. Let me let me spoil the fourth page here. He goes up to uh, the female new Thor and says, "What have you done with my mother?" Ah, well. So we still don't know what's up. Who is she? We still don't know as of this issue. Nope. We're going to have to read it, and we're going to have to keep reading it. We, we're, we're, we're never going to stop reading it. We're going to read this comic until I just want to know who the frig of this is. Oh. You know what, Kevin? What? <clears throat> we need to talk about your top five now. Okay. All right. So my top five. Hey, uh, uh, speaking of Tim Seeley, hey, we've got a new one. So uh, Tim Seeley, as we were saying, now now you know you know Troy that uh, if you ask me what are my favorite types of comics, just broadly, you know I like '80s Marvel and I like Vertigo, right? That's that's like my favorites of all time. Well, that here is we go. Thing. Here's Tim Seeley uh, doing a new Vertigo book. Effigy. Effigy number one, and uh, this kind of has a bit of a. Almost a, a manga sort of a look to it. Uh, it's got kind of a uh, uh, an Asian influence and kind of glowy sort of uh, uh, coloring uh, in at least the beginning section. That this section isn't showing a glowing glowy coloring, but uh, I don't know. I'm interested. Uh, you you kind of can't lose with Tim Seeley, so uh, I'm gonna pick this up. And that is my first one for this week. Hold on, hold on. What, uh, you want to see, show some more? Yeah, I, uh, I wanted to show one page that had some, you know, some dialogues. You we don't want to show that page. No, no, not that it's page. Not all ages. This is Vertigo, by the way. This is a mature reader's book. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, oh, there we go. I wanted some action. Or a little more action. Action that I can show that is actually <laughs> safe for work. Different sort of action, of course. And, of course, uh, you know... Vertigo, you know, you're you're gonna have you're gonna have a good time. Speaking of, you're gonna have a good time. Image and Jonathan Hickman, a new Jonathan Hickman book. Uh, yeah, the Dying in the Dead, number one. And I, uh, I I read through. This is a really thick book. It's it's like 450, but it's re- I think you're getting what you pay for, and then some uh, by today's standards. At the very least, um, it's a really thick book, and it seems to be a uh, a spy thriller. And it starts out with um, uh, 
a uh, starts out with a wedding and uh, that that goes horribly wrong. Lots of shooting and stuff. Um, anyway, I'm interested. I'm gonna get it. It's Jonathan Hickman. You gotta love him from uh, the Avengers, among F- other. Points. Fantastic Four. Uh, yes. Uh, well, yes. Fantastic Four in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, in general. Uh, yes, and let, let's not forget uh, Jonathan Hickman's uh, East of West. Okay, fair enough. And as always, the eleventh Doctor. Like I say, I'm a I'm a bow tie guy, and the eleventh Doctor. Well, you know, hey, bow ties are cool. Um, we've got uh, number what is this seven this week? Eleventh Doctor number seven, uh, and this is the photo cover. There's also a uh, non photo cover uh, with uh, with him on the outside of a helicopter. Um, but uh, this looks like it's kind of action-packed. I'm, I, I'm honestly not entirely loving the art on this series, but the writing is solid. Rob Williams doing the, uh, the writing on this. So, uh, anyway, Titan Comics, Doctor Who, the 11th Doctor, yes, number indeed. 7. Uh, also, check out the Adventures of the 10th Doctor and the Adventures of the 12th Doctor. Uh, yep. No reason to not be getting all three Doctors. Unless you really dislike them, but frankly, these stories are great. No reason not to be getting all three Doctors. Particularly if you're buying them from Troy. <laughs> anyway, my next one, Uncanny Avengers number 1. It's back, and it's number 1. I don't know why it's back, but Uncanny Avengers has been solid in the past. So, uh, what do we got here? Vision and Scarlet Witch? Who else? Well, see, here, Tell me here, the story, Troy. Here's the thing, Kev. The reason this book is back is because the Uncanny Avengers, as we knew them prior to the events of Axis, hmm. are no more. Oh. This team is disbanded. People went their separate ways. We got Brother this, Voodoo? Uh, Dr. Voodoo, if you please. Oh, uh, Dr. Voodoo. <laughs> what? He goes and gets his PhD, and everybody's got to call him Doctor now. Hey, hey, he was Sorcerer Supreme for a time there. It, well, how did he get demoted? The strange was like, all right, all right, uh, you know, I got to have it back. Is that what it was? <sighs> Once again, Kevin, you're just going to have to crack into all of the pages, uh, all of the comics that you've just fallen behind on. You have a lot of catching up to do since uh, 2010. Arg. Yeah. I think it was, uh, gosh, somewhere around 2011 that I that I dropped off kind of sharply and have only gotten back into it since I've been here. Thanks to Troy. I, I like to do my part. Uh, shout outs to the creative team of Rick Remender and Daniel Acuna. Uh, the ama- Acuna, he's got the Enya. It's right there. Uh, sorry, my pronunciations are not quite as elaborate as yours. <laughs> Uncanny Avengers number one, picking up the threads from the end of Axis. Those of you who read Axis know that the ninth issue might have been the conclusion of the series, but the stories weren't done yet. We are now moving on and advancing those subplots, and Uncanny Avengers number one is a big step in that direction. What's next on the hit parade, Kev? Hey, guess what? Uh, this is no shock to uh, our, our ongoing fans, but uh, I really love this Spider-Verse thing. And this week, we've only got one. It's Spider-Man 2099. This is one that you don't have to have. Should you have it? Yes, it's amazing. It's a great series. You should you should get all of them. Um, but uh, if you're just reading Spider Verse itself and Amazing Spider Man, those are what hold that that arc, that that main story arc. And the rest of these are just spinoffs. Are are they stories within themselves that are worthwhile? Absolutely. Um, these are. Uh, uh, this this is a really well done event, and I I I, I couldn't be happier with it. I I well, want to get all of them. A, a tangential to the event uh, is the story of uh, Miguel, who is Spider Man from the year twenty ninety nine. He is trapped here in the twenty first century with yeah. us. Uh, events coming out of uh, Superior Spider Man, actually, it goes that far back. Yeah. Um, and so he finds himself working for a corporation here. Uh, his secret is known to just a few people. His situation is not entirely comfortable, and now on top of balancing his personal life in mimic of the Peter Parker, you know, the classic Peter Parker, trying to balance a regular life, work, home, balance. Oh, no, none of that for you, Miguel, because you're neck deep in the Spider-Verse storyline where the hunters are pursuing the spiders and killing them when they catch them. Uh, it goes badly to be a spider guy, but the spiders are fighting back. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, well, and I, I'm hoping... Uh, after after all of this, and I, I guess perhaps after all of the uh, 
uh, the the stuff that we know is now coming up in uh, Secret Wars. I, I'm kind of hoping that Miguel sticks around. I mean, really, I, I, I'm just as happy if he's in, uh, you know, 2015 or he's in 2099. Uh, yes, indeed. So, uh, writing by Peter David, uh, pretty awesome stuff. Definitely want to jump into this. Spider-Man 2099. Can't go wrong with Peter David. Well, th- that's our top fives for this week, but we do have plus ones. Uh, well, I got a plus one. I want to shout this out real quick. I won't go on at great length, but I do want to tell people who have been reading the Multiversity this week, DC has released the multiversity guidebook hang on let me get let me get a grip on that there this is a thick book it's uh yeah, the multiversity books have a larger page count than uh, your standard uh, DC issues anyway, and a slightly higher uh, cover price to account for that. Uh, the multiversity guidebook will go along as a companion to everybody who is reading uh, where, ooh, Biomac, what is that? Oh my goodness. Here, let me, let me, I don't want to spoil anything really, truly heavily, but you know what? I said it, so let me show it. There we go. Uh, Together for the first time, Batman of two worlds, the last boy on Earth faces his destiny, revealed secret maps of the multiverse, the House of Heroes under siege, meet the superheroes of 52 Earths. Grant Morrison, Multiversity, Multiversity Guidebook. This is something you really want to have. And this is like Batmite on the cover? That's Uh, weird. You know what? it, it, It might be fun, but it just seems... Really? Oh, I mean, obviously, I'm the guy who just who who just promoted uh, the the Spider Verse. Spider Verse. This has got sp- the, uh, you know Spider Ham in it. So yeah, yeah. It does. I, I really can't talk, but that's that. Seems, do you do you that seems like daring? Seems Kevin. Daring. Kevin, do you like the writings of Grant Morrison? Has Grant Morrison let you down in the past? Let me just show you a picture of me and Grant Morrison, uh, both really drunk together. And uh, never mind. Well, sh- I'll show it to you later. Yeah, yeah. But. So, uh, but yes, I do, and yes, I don't, because there are some things that he's written that I'm like, Grant, what are you doing? Yeah, uh, I haven't read those things. Uh, so, Multiversity, you probably want to pick that up. If you like the writings of Grant Morrison, if you like the multiverse as a things. concept, you really want to get that. I, 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 I kind of want to check it out, frankly. Uh, yes, you do. All right. <laughs> so, uh, are you ready for my special guest? I'm jazzed. I'm excited. I can't wait. All right. We'll do my plus one at the end because that, that's a good way to lead us out. Yes, indeed. All right. All right. So, uh, I'm going to push you out of my way here, Kevin, and make a little room for my special guest. Special uh, guest. Yes, indeed. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me today Mr. Chris Schreiner. Uh, and uh, there we go. Now you got a microphone. Uh, Chris. Good evening. Tell everybody about yourself, everything there is to know about you. Everything there is to know. Well, my name is Chris Schreiner. I'm with the Iron Fist League. We're a tabletop gaming group, and uh, I like long walks on the beach, and my left foot is a size and a half larger than my right. So we're pretty excited about that. (laughs) That's uh, actually pretty valuable information to know. There we are. Uh, But the reason I'm here tonight is to talk about the gaming that we do at Flashback Comics and Gaming. And we're uh, <clears throat> in my group. We're working with primarily two game systems. Uh, the first one is Warhammer Forty Thousand by Games Workshop. This is a tabletop miniature game um, played by two players. And we'll take a quick look at some of the uh, figures and um, stuff you have here. Uh, yes, thank you for bringing the <clears throat> yeah, props. Uh, do you need an extra pair of hands here? Uh, I think I'm all right. Oh, all right, there you're in charge. Great. All right, so with uh, Warhammer 40,000, there's a number of factions available, uh, more than 10 these days. This particular one is from the Grey Knights. That is a, um, a militant faction of the church in the, in the far future. And so their main goal is to go in to fight demons. And this is a good segue because we're going to see some demons here that they'll be fighting in just a little bit. Um, and so I'll, while we're doing that, this is a generally a two-player game. Um, people can do just regular casual games. There's a thriving tournament scene all through the area. Uh, people go to conventions to play the game. Um, yeah, uh, there's a large convention in, in um, Crystal City in August called the Nova Open, where it's mainly a Warhammer 40,000. They have several hundred players that go there and play. Um, here's another figure. This is a Grey Knight Terminator, not the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator, but a Space Marine Terminator. Um, so the when you're playing these games, the sizes of armies you'll be dealing with is anywhere from, say, 20 models or so with an army like the Grey Knights, or with um, armies that have cheaper troops, you can have as many as 300 models on the table at one time. 
Now, when you're playing with something that has that many models, it's going to take a little bit of time. So a typical game of Warhammer 40,000 between two players will take anywhere from two to three hours of actual game time that you're playing, plus a little bit of time to set up and break down at the end. So, and it's a um, one player person will take their their complete turn, which is broken into three phases: you move, you shoot, and then you assault. That that is get into get into close combat, and then the other player takes their turn doing the same thing. And it's done over anywhere from five to seven turns, depending on the game. So it's a pretty interactive thing. It uses a whole lot of dice, a D6 dice. Now, um, circling back to the the figures we have here, these are the Gray Knights. These are the forces of good of the Church and all that. And this guy here is a, um, what they call a Chaos Berserker, riding on a demon mount. Um, Chaos Berserker, Chaos is, has two other factions, that is the Chaos Space Marines, which is what this guy is, and there's also Chaos Demons that we'll see here in just a minute. This particular one in the Warhammer 40k lore, there's four gods of Chaos. This is a devotee of the god of corn, the god of blood. So they're all about blood for the blood god. Very exciting stuff. Now, uh, Chris, if I could just interrupt you for sure. one second. Uh, the game sounds kind of complex. Is it, you know, really, truly hard to play? Do you need a Ph.D. for this? Uh, a Ph.D., no. But I'll tell you what you do need. You do need uh, a core rule book, which admittedly, there's about 90 pages of rules. It is a reasonably complex game. And you additionally need a book called a codex that tells you about the units inside each army. So uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve to play it. But that said, uh, there is a tremendous amount of depth to the game. And not just the uh, rolling the dice and moving your guys around, there's a lot of activity that happens before you even roll up to the game. Uh, you need to create your list and figure out, okay, if I'm, I need to prepare for a mechanized list. Like you can play an army that has mainly tanks. You can play ones that have lots and lots of infantry or a combination of those. So there's a lot of thought that goes into how you build your list and what forces you bring to the battle. And additionally, uh, beyond just playing two-player battles, you can also play huge battles uh, called apocalypse ma matches. Now, in a normal battle, you can do, say, 1850 points, that is points per side. Now, with apocalypse matches, you're doing 15,000 or 20,000 points per side using huge models. And this is one. This particular one is from the Chaos side. This is the uh, a greater demon lord of Nurgle, the god of disease and decay, my chosen patron god of Chaos when I'm playing. Now this guy, this is a not a standard model. This is from a special shop, a uh, games workshop called Forge World. It's a resin piece. And um, pretty heavy. Yeah, it's, it's literally a big chunk of resin. It's like a crazy expensive baseball. Um, now, another thing about these, all these models come in gray plastic or resin in this case, and they require assembly. So in addition to gameplay, there's an extensive hobby side of this that is putting the models together, customizing how you do them, and or how you how you pose them, and even painting them. Uh, two of the uh, some of the Grey Knights I've done, some of the um, the Chaos guys, and the Granite Terminator, and other other members of our club have done. And so this is one more. This is a Helldrake of Chaos. And so, you know, you have mechanized forces, you have infantry forces, and you have flyers that are on the game. This is a demon seed or demon flyer machine uh, for the forces of chaos that shoots a breath weapon out. It's pretty devastating into infantry. And uh, you can see the model is incredibly detailed. This particular one is plastic. And you may also notice on this one, it has a different base than the other flyer did. There's a good, there's a thriving market of other manufacturers that have special bases. This is a custom resin base on there that you can, you know, paint to how you how you see fit. And so that's a, uh, a short version or short description of Warhammer 40,000. Um, is now for full disclosure, some of these models are not the cheapest things in the world, and you'll be in for realistically probably several hundred to get a functioning army. That said, you can play that army for a really long period of time and you get a huge amount of enjoyment out of it from putting it, putting it together, painting it, and then playing it for years and years. And periodically the uh, armies will get re-released to follow new updates and new rules, and then that old army you had is new again. Well now, I, I've, I've seen you guys play, and you're a, a pretty advanced group of players, I would assume. Uh, if you're just getting started, 
how large an investment, you know, in terms of miniature pieces, sure. ships, that sort of thing. I mean, can, can you start small and build, or do you need to come in a little more full bore? Uh, you can indeed start small and build. They have a starter set that is somewhere, I think, around $90 or so. Don't quote me on that. But that includes a basic rule book and some basic figures just to get you started. So you don't have to jump in with several hundred. But this is a good way to get a taste for the uh, working with the models and playing the game in a basic sense. Uh, what's about the average age range of players? Uh, players here, I've, we've had people in our club anywhere from 18 to their 60s. Uh, we Quite often in a, around here, it's government contractors, military, ex-military types. We tend to be as a group. But uh, there's a whole, like some of the best players in the world are college age players. So there's a really wide range of players in the game and it supports, a, and depending on what you're interested in. If you're interested in a hobby, we have people that mainly like to paint the uh, models and some that don't like to paint so much, but really like to play. So this particular hobby can appeal to a large, a large variety of players. Well, that is incredible. I, I'm, I'm getting excited here to see the other pieces right. you've got. So, uh, so this wh is a, where do we go next? <laughs> right. So we're going for the really, you know, the much more complicated and involved miniature game of Warhammer 40,000 versus a newer game uh, of Star Wars X-Wing by Fantasy Flight Games. Now, you may, you of course, be, will be familiar with this guy. Fantasy Flight Games. I can hear the sound effects. Yeah. <laughs> uh this is your standard TIE Fighter. This game is a squad-based flight, you know, space combat game produced by Fantasy Flight Games, and currently there you can play in either of two factions, the Galactic Empire or the Rebellion. Um, now this game is much, much smaller, uh, smaller game to play than Warhammer 40K, whereas Warhammer you'll have anywhere from 40 to 100 or more pieces on the table. With X-Wing, one player will have, at maximum, eight ships on the table. That In this case, you could have eight TIE Fighters. And you can have iconic ships out there. You can play as Han in the Millennium Falcon with Chewie as a crew member. You can play as a member of the Empire in the Slave One with Boba Fett on board. And they have a, there's a really large number of ships that are out there. All the iconic ships, you've got A-Wings, X-Wings, Y, E, the whole whole uh, variety of ships. And you also have um, some other ships that you may not be as familiar with. I am not familiar with this at right. all. So this guy, if you played Star Wars Galaxies, the MMO, this was a ship that was created specifically for Star Wars Galaxy. This is the VT-49 Decimator. And this is a big turret ship for the Empire. And Fantasy Flight was able to get this into the game. And this is now, you know, for officially supported in the new Star Wars canon, right? And additionally, um, Fantasy Flight was able to work with Lucasfilm and create a, a brand new ship that is now part of the canon called the Imperial, Imperial Raider. It's not out yet, but it is coming soon. So in this game, these games take about, actually they take, take exactly an hour to play and there's a new and thriving uh, tournament scene that is sponsored and managed by FFG with a series of store championships, regional tournaments, nationals, and then the world tournaments. So there's an active uh, tournament player base and there's a lot of people that are getting into this game. It's actually the pieces are a little hard to find right now because it's so popular and people are buying it whenever it comes in. Well, I guess that means they'll just uh, raise the production levels. That's what they're working on, but it, <laughs> people keep coming in because it's a really great game. This particular game, the mechanics of it is uh, you put your ships down and then you do a selection of uh, maneuver dials. Say, okay, my TIE fighters are going to move forward a certain amount. And you're placing your dials while your opponent is trying to figure out what you're going to do and then placing and selecting his dials to counter what he thinks you will do. And so it's very much a this ship moves and that ship moves kind of deal. And you very quickly see, oh gosh, I didn't expect that. And now my TIE fighter is in trouble because Luke is flying his X-Wing on my tail. And oh look, dead TIE fighter. Now, I understand that this is uh, more of a tabletop war game as opposed to a role-playing game. But do they take into account things that are inimic to the Star Wars universe, like Luke Skywalker having access to the Force? I mean, are there rules modifiers, I guess, that cover some of these more intangible qualities? There are indeed. Um, so we have a series of generic pilots. You can be a member of Red Squadron on the X-Wing, and it's an average guy or whatever, but you can have Luke Skywalker and the actual R2-D2. R2-D2 can repair damage to his X-Wing. Uh, Han Solo, 
there's a list called Han shoots first. Han is a really highly skilled pilot, <laughs> and he can literally be the first person to shoot in the game because of his particular sets of abilities. Wow. Yeah. And <laughs> all right, I need. Wait, I, I need to. See, you need to get cozy there. Get cozy. <laughs> all right, I have a question. All right, so what is the relationship to this uh, this this current uh, X-wing game compared with that that pop out and and assemble cardstock game that I think was also called X-wing? Are they the same game? Are they different? These are made different games. So. All right, but, but had totally you had, had you played the original? I was I was not involved in the original one. But you know what I'm talking about. It was like I'm it was vaguely like, aware. Oh, <laughs> I want to say that it was. I want to say it was WizKids it, that, that it, did it. It may well have been. And uh, actually, to that point, WizKids licensed this rule set yeah. and has the Star Trek Attack Wing game that is out and available now for right. those of you who are of the Star Trek equation persuasion rather than you know the far superior Star Wars. So, but what if you're both? Well, you know, we don't like to talk about that, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's between you and your family. Now, are, are, they this, are they the same uh, rules? Like, could you, in theory, go and, and uh, decide to integrate the two? Uh, integrating the two, less so. The mechanics are indeed the same. You use the same dials. In, they have the same shapes of the ships. Yeah. But the particulars of how the, sh the special abilities and such are done... Mm -hmm. uh, WizKids has gone off on their own in their own directions and how they design the cards and the abilities. Gotcha. And it's a reasonably different playing experience based on the abilities. The mechanics are still the same. You're still doing certain moves in shooting, but a lot of it's fairly different. So I have another question. All right, so you went in with uh, with the Warhammer 40K and said that uh, an army could, can easily cost you uh, hundreds of dollars, several hundreds of dollars to to do a uh, a full uh, army. And and when when it comes to X Wing here, uh, what's what's the cost there? So uh, the X Wing starter set by itself is. 30 or 40 dollars yep. you can be fully tournament ready with a competitive list as winning championships for a hundred bucks or less that's uh, nice a, sh a single ship will cost maybe 15 dollars 30 for the big guys uh -huh. and think about it at, at maximum you can only have eight ships there's not that much money to be spent on this so when it comes to because uh, I mean, we mentioned whiz kids and and uh people uh cheap Cheap people like myself, uh, who played Heroclix back in the day, are like, "Oh, girl, you know, whiz kids and, and wizards and 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 places like that. They 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 retire um, items from their sets. You know, whether whether it's cards or or figures." Um, the things get retired. I'm assuming, being as though the investment is far larger in these, that you're not seeing things retired. That's correct. It's actually good you mentioned that. Uh, FFG is doing a very good job of watching the tournament meta and seeing how ships are performing in the various events. So they are taking a proactive approach to this. Uh, Darth Vader's ship, the TIE Advanced, wasn't seeing a lot of play, and people were generally not using it because it was too expensive point-wise in the game for what it was used for. Uh, FFG watched this, and it recognized it. And with a new ship that's coming out, they're re releasing additional cars to adjust the uh, cost of the TIE Advance to make it more competitive. So they're actively adjusting the game. Now they're not um, eliminating any cars and retiring them, so you don't have the risk of, you've got this great thing that is now obsolete. Glad to hear it. Yeah. That, that's, that's, that's the sort of game that I want to play. Frankly, indeed. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, Kevin, uh, you could uh, pick up uh, X Wing, uh, the box set uh, over at uh, Flashback Comics and Games. I know it. <laughs> and uh, as soon as my toddler uh, allows for such things, as soon as my my personal issues uh, get resolved, and I start collecting all those comics that you make me. Because <laughs> this guy, um, then yeah, I definitely want to get back into gaming. And and while this seems, while this does seem particularly interesting, uh, I, I really want to try out the new D and D because back in the day, back in the day, I was the uh, San Diego High School uh, Gaming Club. I was the president back in nineteen a long time ago. <laughs> it was a previous millennium. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm a gamer from way back. Oh uh, yeah, well you know we'll actually uh, talk about uh, role playing games in another segment. Right, but but war game, you know like or, you know or, or ta not necessarily yeah. war gaming, but, but yeah. tabletop gaming. Like I say, I used to run uh, 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 what do you call uh, HeroClicks back in the day. Oh yeah, uh, for a little comic store that is that is. Uh, 
sadly gone long ago. Um, well, we're still here. You're still here. We gave you a new home. You did, and I'm I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm really thrilled you were here to to come and, and join us again. Will you will you come back and show us some more games another time? Happy to. Hey, thank you so much for coming, much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Reiner. Appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Uh, all right, we're uh, and uh, at, before we leave this week, uh, I just want to say that that my plus ones. Here at Flashback Comics and Games, <laughs> Troy's got for you a couple of really special items. These are uh, kind of hard to find. There's not a ton of them. Guardians of the Galaxy, we've got uh, both Groot and Rocket. And, and well, we, we need to mention that the Rocket Raccoon, which does require some assembly, yeah. uh, includes a potted baby Groot. A little tiny one of these. While the Groot comes with a small rocket that stands at his feet with a snarl and a really big gun. Yeah. So, uh, anyway. Oh, and then, of course, everyone needs this. Yeah. So come back next week, folks, because, oh, baby, give us one more chance, will ya? Won't ya? And come after after we eat, we're going to have part two and and so forth. From leaping tall builders to going off like gamma bombs. Switch your internet browser to comicsonline.com.